Well, here we are in chapter 7 of Nehemiah. Got a little ways to go, but the walls are built. And uh, we have 73 verses. Are we going to read them all today? No! Don't panic. Uh, what was read is what was read. You know, we're not going really any further than that. But here's Nehemiah. The walls are built. And now he seeks to just like perpetuate the achievements that are made. And he does that by appointing successors and, and establishing sound policies so that this ministry that took place, rebuilding the walls and getting Jerusalem back where it belongs, would continue, all right? And continue successfully. So that was really important. So in those first three verses, real quick here, after the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Levites were appointed, and I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hananiah, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. So here we have the walls finished. What's Nehemiah going to do? I mean, the walls are up, right? Everything's good. No worries, right? No, no. He had to take precautions still because they're, they're built, but uh, there's people out there who still would seek to destroy them. You know? So first we see that he begins by appointing the people that would be responsible for ensuring the safety of the city and guarding those gates. That was important to them. So he appoints the residents. He says, you guys need to stand guard at points, and he puts them at the weakest points of the city. Now, as we walk through this today, I think there's wonderful parallels to our Christian life. In fact, the whole Old Testament uh, really happened. Did you know that? I mean, it really happened, the Old Testament. And you saw the power of God really at work in this world, physically doing incredible things for his people. That's the Old Testament. God really did these things. And we transfer over to the New Testament. The same God that could do the impossible could intervene in, in nature and intervene in these circumstances. That same God, that same God's power is available to each one of us in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And God, we see the God who did incredible things physically he wants to now let us know that he will empower us spiritually to do things. As they were able to stand up against physical enemies in our lives, guys, we have spiritual enemies we need to stand up against. You know, there are some, some people who believe that all these big signs and wonders are taking place today. Okay? I mean, they, they love the Lord, but they're so caught up into the signs and wonders. You know the greatest signs and wonders ministry that has ever happened is happening today. And you know what it is? It's the fact that you and I, through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life as believers, can say no to sin. That is the greatest signs and wonders that has ever happened before. We have the ability to always say no to sin. Titus says that you can say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts, and we can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And we can do that because the same God who did the incredible physically, that same power, indwells us through his Holy Spirit, and we can say no. And you know, most of the time, though, no one sees that. No one sees that miraculous signs and wonders taking place. Why is that? Because it's just you. And it's, it's happening in you. The battle that's in you, that the enemy attacks, people don't always see that. But you stand strong in the face of temptation. That is the greatest thing. You can have victory over sin through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, there you go. I should just stop right now. And I think that's what we're seeing from Nehemiah with what took place. But we got to put up guards, just like he had to put up guards. So he makes careful plans for the opening and closing of the gates. And he sets out these uh, rules that there would be watchers and that these, these watchers would determine and be on guard against possible attack. 
Because he realized they were still subject to attack. Just because the walls were up didn't mean that the enemy gave up. All right? And so he said, you know what? We're going to keep these doors closed until it says, until the sun is hot. Do not open them until the sun is hot. Now, it's, I look at that and I go, that's pretty obvious to me. You keep them closed until the sun is hot, right? <laughs> but there's two views on that by commentators, so I should just throw them out to you. And their wording, they say, is unclear on whether when the gates were open. So they once said, early, open early in the morning and then close when it gets hot because that's after the midday meal and siesta, I guess, you know, and people are tired and it's just, they're vulnerable. So that's what some people think and maybe that's what it is. But uh, it, whether it's keep them, keep them closed until the noonday or uh, clo close them at the noonday, it really didn't matter because the workers understood, okay, what he wanted them to do. But I just throw it out there. It's, it's unclear to us perhaps, but it was clear to the leaders uh, and the gatekeepers, they understood the instructions. But we need to protect ourselves. And you know, if you aren't protecting yourselves, if you're not being on guard, does Satan have, are you like easy prey? If you're not spending time in God's Word, are you easy prey? You are. If you're not talking to God about the circumstances you're facing, are you bound to make a mistake and regret it later? Yeah, you probably are. So you gotta be careful on those things. So the walls are rebuilt, but it wasn't a time to just relax. See, you came to faith in Christ. Oh, I guess that's it. Is that, was that what you did? No. It's, the walls are built. The city is secure, right? But now it's not a time to let down the guard. You could even say it's probably that since the walls have been built and the gates have been put in place, there might even be a time of increased risk. You know, increased risk of, of defeat, increased risk of destruction because you could let your guard down. And Nehemiah said, no, no, we've, God sent us here. We've worked too hard. This city is, represents Jehovah God, and we're going to protect this city. And so the enemies were surrounding them. The enemies are eager to defeat them. The enemies are eager to attack them. Uh, and you really, I think, Nehemiah understood it, that Jerusalem would always be under continual attack. They always had to be on their guard. And so do you. Don't give the devil how much? Even a crevice, right? Even a foothold in your life. You know, I would say to people, and I have to say to myself, but I'd say to students all over the years, and I say to myself, you know, how much ungodly influence is too much ungodly influence in your life? You ever ask yourself that? How much ungodly influence is too much ungodly influence? Because there's lots of ungodly influence, right? The answer is any, isn't it? But I'm so stupid at times. And I invite ungodly influence into my life. By where I might go, what I might listen to, what I might put on, put on the screen. You know, in the moment you just don't think about it sometimes. But how much ungodly influence? Is too much un uh, ungodly influence for you and me? The answer is any. So let's, let's be on guard against that, right? And when we run across it, it's like, well, I'm going to get rid of that one. I'm going to let that one go out of my life. We've got to be careful with that thing. So that's a basic spiritual principle here that great victory doesn't silence our enemies. That was a great victory. Remember, they were mocked and mocked and tried to create fear and they tried to confuse them and tried to deceive them. And it's like, no, they fought through that. The, the walls are built. They put up the guards. And people are protecting themselves with weapons while they're building. And yay, the walls are done. The gates are up. We've done it. <laughs> you know, we've got to be careful. You think, what a great victory. And I'm telling you, in your spiritual life, when you do have a victory, Satan wants to right away bring you back down to earth, so to speak, doesn't he? I remember when I probably went on one of our first teen mission trips. I come home, and I couldn't tell you the specifics of that one. I couldn't tell you the specifics on others. But it happened all the time. You come home after a week or two away, and you get hit with something. Just... Out of the blue, could be the day you got back, because Satan wants to bring you down. He wants you to forget about the good that he has been doing or the good he did there. Be very careful. You're going to get back from those trips, Satan. He doesn't want you rejoicing in what God has done. He wants you to fear. He wants you to doubt. He wants to defeat you. So you really got to be careful in those times of great spiritual victory. 
He's powerful, he's vile, and he's not going to give up on defeating you. So we, you and I need to never let our guards down because we never know when an attack's going to come. Is that brilliant? Did I just say something brilliant? <laughs> you never know, do you? When an attack's going to come. Because if you did, then you'd be ready. You know, when, when the, thief, the strong man knew when the thief was going to break in, he'd be ready there. You know, with the Cubs baseball bat so he can knock the guy to oblivion, right? No, Cubs stink, so it wouldn't do you any good uh, at least right now. But no, you don't know when those attacks are going to come, so you got to do your best to be ready. you got to keep spending time in God's Word, and you got to be talking to God a lot, right? Can you talk to God a lot? Yeah, it's like throughout the day, whatever you're doing. I remember I was on a trip in Kansas City, Dave and Ashley Elliott, and now they're in the Pakistan-India uh, border. They've been there now for about 10 years. But we were walking in Kansas City, in Kansas, Kansas City, doing some door-to-door -door with them, with students, and these girls were telling me that, that they were walking with Ashley, and she was talking to herself. And they thought, whoa, that's weird. She's talking to herself. Well, what she was doing was praying out loud. As she's walking down the street, she's just praying, talking out loud to God. You can do that. Isn't that amazing? You could do that. And we can, we need to talk to God all the time. We've got to share our heart with Him, and He shares His heart with us, right? We need to do that. And that keeps us alert. That keeps us ready. we got to be in tune with our Heavenly Father. We don't know when Christ is going to come. We don't know when temptation is going to come into our life. You don't know when fear, fear is going to enter and try to just crumble you. Because that's what fear does. We don't want to have that happen in our life. So every believer, every follower of Christ should be on guard against attack. That really is a principle that we should have that we watch and we pray. You know, in Scripture, Jesus told the disciples to watch and pray. He said in Matthew 26, he says, watch and pray so that what won't happen? You won't fall into temptation. You go, really? But I won't. I don't want to. Yeah, the spirit is willing, but you got a flesh. But the flesh is weak. He says in Mark 13, be on your guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. And again in Mark, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Again, the spirit is willing. But dude, you got flesh. You got a sin nature. And that's weak. You got to you got to protect yourself. There's two Greek words for that word watch. They're in your notes and they're up there for you. And the Mark 26 and Mark 14 passage, it had the idea of being vigilant, to, to keep awake, to be on the alert, to keep one's eyes open. I guess like the, when they were standing guard, right? You know, be vigilant. Pay attention. Don't get caught off guard because he's sneaky. He's roaming around like a roaring lion looking for the people who have let down their guard. And then the other one in Mark 13 means to be sleepless. Okay? Sleepless. You know, just like, I'm not going to be tired. Sleepless. To keep awake for the purpose of watching. Okay? On guard. Watch it. Jesus, when he said watch and pray, man, that was great advice. But that's what's needed if we're going to have victory in our Christian life. So it's a great reminder to be watchful in order to flee from sin and to maintain our trust in Christ. And second, Nehemiah, he moves on and he appoints two leaders. Remember, he wants to make sure this continues. He's going to be heading back to Babylon, right? He's already been here 12 years. <laughs> and he's going to be heading back at some point. And so he puts in charge, well, he hasn't been 12 years at that point, but he's going to be in there 12 years. He puts in charge of Jerusalem his brother Hananiah along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel. So Nehemiah's brother, you know, he was the one that we think back in uh, chapter 1 came and gave him the report about what was happening in Jerusalem. But he had demonstrated faithfulness. He had demonstrated integrity that he's someone that could be trusted. And he probably worked along those who were uh, building the wall and worked along those who were defending against the attack. And he served the people. I think probably even in Nehemiah 5 where we saw how Nehemiah didn't take advantage of his position. He didn't indulge himself with what he could do with the best of things. He didn't do that. And I think that his brother Han Hananiah was right along with him refusing to indulge in a lavish lifestyle. He had proven he was someone that Nehemiah could trust, that he could leave the, the city of Jerusalem 
under his control. And then also, uh, Hananiah. What a reputation that guy had, right? Man, he was a man of integrity. And look what it said. He feared God. And he feared God more than most do. He really feared. I mean, there's probably a lot of great guys there. But he feared God. And he adds that more than most. Well, he was exemplary in his life. And so if you and I want to please God with our life, here's a great character description of Hananiah, that to have, a tech, have integrity and fear God above anyone else. And we can stand strong. Stephen did it. We mentioned Stephen a few weeks ago. He wasn't afraid of what people were going to do to him. In fact, God says, don't, don't worry about those who can kill the body. You're going to worry about somebody. You should fear the one who can kill the body and the soul, right? But he feared God, and he had reverence for God and love for God. Not just like, oh, no, God. He, more than most. You know, you know how that is. You, you've been around people who say they know Jesus, and they don't sure seem to take it real seriously, right? They don't really have a reverence of fear or love for God, you know? And you and I need to be that person who says, I'm going to take what it means to be living for Jesus seriously. What it means to represent Christ. I'm going to take that seriously. I'm going to put guards up in my life, and I want to help other people put guards up in their lives. That's the type of person we want to be. And I think that's the type of person Hananiah was. And then in the rest of the chapter, we see that he's given over to the preserving the purity of God's city. You know, he's committed to the Jews committing the Jews to the cause. That cause, this is God's city. It's been in shambles. It's been in rumbles. It's been, our God has been mocked. There's been no respect for our God. We've got to bring back respect to our God and restore the city of Jerusalem. And he had to put those who would be there. So he turns his attention away from the walls, away from all the physical defenses. And he says, you know, I'm interested in the spiritual integrity of the people. I'm interested in developing spiritual integrity in the lives of people. And that's part of what local church should be interested in, too. You could call that what? Discipleship. That we help each other grow in our love for Jesus Christ. We support one another so that each other can stand strong in their faith and their love for Jesus Christ. Boy, if you have a need and you're struggling, don't hold it in. Let somebody know. So someone can help you through those things. And if you see somebody you know needs help to grow in their walk with Jesus Christ, then you need to step in and try to help them. Offer assistance to them. Not physical defenses anymore, the spiritual integrity, the development of people of God. And so it's necessary uh, to ensure that only true Israelites would live, live in Jerusalem. Because people were living in the countryside, nobody was really living in Jerusalem. Now that the walls are up, there's some security. But still, the buildings were mostly in rubble still inside the walls. But people still wanted to live inside the walls of Jerusalem. But he was only going to let those who were true Israelites live in the city of Jerusalem. And so, in the list that go further, that, that we're not going to read, there follows names of families of those who came back from Persia to Jerusalem. And he did that under the leadership of Ezra and some 30 years before the time of Nehemiah. So in verses 4 to 5 it says, Now the city was large and spacious, but there were a few people in it, and the houses had not been rebuilt. So my God put it in my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. And I found the gene gene genealogical record of those who had been the first to return, and this is what I found written there. So as we saw in the earlier chapters, uh, the people that were living in the countryside, they were the ones who came along and they helped rebuild the wall. And so in the list, if you were to read all those verses in those lists, he's giving credit to all those people. You know, we don't have time to read those extra 50, 60 verses, okay? Plus, I don't want to read those names, okay? But you feel free to do that because God doesn't waste his time on names. But, you know, I'm not going to read all those names to you, okay? But he's giving credit to people. Uh, he wants also for them to recognize that the people, it's your responsibility now. I can only do so much. I'm this one guy. I'm Nehemiah, and I've done what God has asked me to do. It is your responsibility to carry this on, to bring glory back to God in the, with the city of Jerusalem. 
So he appoints those leaders who will succeed him, men of integrity, men of, men of courage, men of faithfulness. And now he wants to see to it that the followers are true as Israelites. Well, you don't want people living in that city who you cannot trust, who are truly committed to the Jehovah God. He says, no, nope, we're going to make sure that they're true Israelites. So in verse 6, he says, These are the people of the province who came back from the captivity. Of those who have been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city. And so from verse 6 to verse 60, we have that list, okay, of all these, these people who were able to prove their ancestry. So they could, all right, you could live in God's city. You could do that because they could prove their ancestry. So what's happening here? Again, those who could prove their ancestry, that they're children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were going to be able to live again in the city. That's exciting news that that would happen. But they had been living in the land. They had been living in the promised land that was there, but they weren't able to inhabit that Jerusalem because it was under attack all the time. So now it's secure, and now God's people who could prove their ancestry could live there. And so I think there's a spiritual application to consider. Can I say it that way? That we really need to know that we belong to God. Right? We really need to know that. You need to really know that you belong to God. You know, the Apostle Paul was really concerned about that. And that in 2 Corinthians 13, he said, you really need to know. He said, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. He says, you really need to know. He says, test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust you'll discover that we have not failed the test. You see, Satan is a master, guys, at uh, causing you to doubt your salvation, first off. And he's a master at that. He brings doubts into your life. And if he can get you to doubt, we know he's a liar, okay? And if he can get you to doubt, then he'll weaken your resolve to live for Jesus. Like, I don't know, am I really... I don't know, is Jesus real? You know, if he can do that, he can get you to just weaken your resolve to live for Jesus. There are people today who say, I, I think I'm a child of God. I, I, I hope I'm a child of God. That's sad for someone to have, an, to have a knowledge, but not have actual uh, acceptance of Jesus Christ. I think I am. See, here's the thing. You can know that you're a child of God. Nobody should, I think I am. Because you can know. I mean, Gospel of Jonathan, I mean, you can know all through there. You can know. And in fact, in 1 John 5, 12, he also says, He that hath the Son hath life. Right? And he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. I mean, it's that simple. It's that simple. What do you mean, has the Son? Well, if you've trusted the Lord in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you have Him. Okay? Then you have Him. And you have life. But if you haven't put your faith, then you don't have life. If you put your faith in Christ, then you have on the authority of the word of God, word of God life. You truly are a child of God. I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth, are you alive? And believeth in me, you'll never die. Oh, your body will die, but you'll live eternally with Christ in glory. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can know. In verse 61, though, we go back to the list of those who could not prove their ancestry. The following came up from the towns of, see why I don't write like these words? Of, of Telmea, Telmela, and Telharsha, and Kurub, and Adon, and Emmer, and these are the cities of Persia. But they could not show that their families were descendants from Israel. They couldn't do it. And so the result was they weren't permitted to live in the city of Jerusalem. Because you had to prove you're an Israelite. Only true Israelites. They couldn't prove it. And they couldn't prove it because they had uncertain ancestry. So here's Nehemiah. He's concerned about the purity of the city. That only true Israelites could live in that city. You know, I don't know if this is an Old Testament example of a New Testament truth or not, but that only those who are trusting in Jesus 
for the forgiveness of their sins will be able to enter into God's eternal city. Is that, is that a parallel? You know, it's a good application at least, right? If you don't truly belong to Jesus, man, you're not going to make it. Okay? He's not going to let you into his heaven. And that's the heaven is only for those who Jesus says he knows. Remember, if he knows you, he'll say, welcome in. If he doesn't, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. He even says a work of iniquity. Like, wow, that's pretty harsh. But I think it's a kind of good example. Here on the earth, only true as the lights. Nehemiah, no, you, don't, you can't prove it. You're not in. You can stand before the Lord someday. Why should I let you into my heaven? Because Jesus died for my sins. And I believe that with all my heart. And that's what I'm banking my eternity on, is what Jesus did for me. And welcome on in. Okay? God knows the heart. Then he moves on to the leaders in verse 63. He says, And from among the leaders, the descendants of Hobiah and Hapdaz and Barzillai, a man who had married the daughter of Barzillai, the Gildeite, and was called that by name, these searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. And so the governor therefore ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food, until there should be a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. Now, what was happening is there were already priests, and certain ones among the priests were denied the right to continue to minister because they couldn't prove their ancestry. Wow, I mean, you could have a priest that's truly really not supposed to be a priest. I guess it's possible. You have men in the pulpit today who question their salvation. It could happen. You have men in leadership uh, in churches that aren't sure of their salvation. You ask, well, tell me, brother, when did you come to know Jesus Christ? And it's like, uh, I would hope I'd never hear that. But if you don't know, if you can't truly bank on it with the scripture that God gives you, then you got a problem there. So here you have these guys that had been priests, and now they're, well, wait a minute, you got to stop. We got it. We got to get this figured out. We got to get it figured out. So that's important. If someone's uncertain they belong to God, well, they should never be in leadership. That'll cause confusion. That'll cause disorder in the church. So what's the Urim and what's the Thummim? That's interesting, okay? And Nehemiah says that these subject priests were not allowed to minister. He says until a high priest comes with that. Remember the vest of the high priest? I think there's a picture for you. Yep. There's a picture for you, and they had those stones, and two of them, you know, one was a was the Urim, and one was the, the Thummim. I couldn't tell you which one. That's just a made-up picture anyways, I think. So uh, there were two stones, and their names meant lights and perfection. That's what they meant, lights and perfection. And the high priest wore those on his garment, and the thought was that by these, he could find the mind of God. Right? God would reveal it. You know, God would reveal truth to the high priest. And we know that God did reveal truth to the high priest. And God would do that. So it seems like God would use those stones to reveal the truth so that he could restore a suspect priest uh, and give him assurance and give him this right, rightful place back into his office. And so the closing verses, that if you go through those later and you look at them, you'll see that it gives all the number of the people that returned to Jerusalem. Again, listing all these people to give them credit that God used these people. And then there follows an account of a great offering that was taken for, for the rebuilding of those walls. And then a final note, note uh, how the suburbs were settled and the city was settled. It all goes through that there. But as we draw to a close, I want us to remember again something that Nehemiah has demonstrated <coughs> for us as we've gone through this so far. Uh, and it's with how to stand against the temptations of the day. Because Nehemiah was under attack the entire time. Okay, All different ways trying to get him off track, trying to get him defeated, trying to get him to fail, trying to ruin his reputation. So he gave us some, we see these principles from him. And I think they're the same factors that can enable us to stand today in our Christian walk. And first, he had a great awareness of the magnitude of the task that God had given to him. Boy, if we don't understand what God has us here to do, Guess what? We aren't going to do anything. All right? But when we understand that God has us here as his ambassadors, is to be salt and light, 
you know, then we're going to make that a focus in our life. He had a, he had a ministry to perform. Nehemiah had a, a lifestyle to model to others, and he never forgot that God had sent him to Jerusalem to work and to demonstrate to people how to live. And he was determined to do that. He was focused on the call that God had given him, and he was, because of that, he was steady against the pressure. And by the way, you can do that. When you know God has you somewhere to do a certain thing, you can make it. You can make it. Whatever it is. If God has you in the workplace, and you know that he has you working among people that are lost. And you know you're going to face challenges because you're there. And you're going to be represent Jesus Christ. You expect those things to happen. And you're okay with it. And you can stand strong. Right? And Nehemiah was an example of that to, to us. We're told in, in Acts, Acts 1, that the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can be his what? We can be his witnesses. That's why he gave it. So he wants us to do that. It's an important task. We are supposed to be his witnesses. And so when we don't live for Jesus, are we being his witnesses? No. We're messing it up. We've got to think, what, am I, is what I'm doing going to be a true witness for Jesus Christ? Stay on task. Second Corinthians, again, we are his ambassadors. It says, as if God were making his appeal through us. It's like that. We're, we're all he's got? <laughs> yeah. That he would choose to use jars of clay, just normal, what people would think worthless, to hold the wonderful message and light of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's important. How we live our life matters for the cause of Christ, for the cause of the gospel. Your life matters. What you do today matters. How you speak today, people today, matters. How you respond to what people say and do to you matters. It matters for the cause of Jesus Christ. Second, he never forgot his own identity. He knew who he was. He knew he belonged to God. And he knew that he was part of God's people. You know, he, I'm going for it. Okay, I know who my God is. And we think, I know who, I know whom I have believed. Right? And I am committed that he will keep me to the end, right? I'm going to do this. And we need to be like that. We know we're a child of God. And we know it. And we know it. And we can just walk forward dealing with the struggles that come. He was free third from the influence of others. He just didn't let others distract him. No, no. I'm not, I'm not here to listen to you. I'm not here to be scared by you. I'm here to listen to my God. He refused to listen to every bit of advice that came along. He refused counsel from those who, do, who, didn't, who didn't have access to the wisdom of God. What's, what, what counsel do you listen to, right? Is it godly counsel? Is it godly counsel? And if it is godly counsel, then where does it come from? It comes from God's word, right? Someone wants to encourage you with something? <laughs> if it could, goes along with God's word, that's godly counsel. And that's what you should listen to. And believers who share God's word. So you get your counsel from God's word. You get your counsel from believers who share God's word. You get to give people godly counsel. Okay? You get to. It's not just what you get. You get to give people godly counsel. And if you don't spend time in God's word, then you don't have a whole lot to share of godly counsel. So as God speaks to you through your daily time in God's word, you then... Have something to share with others. Godly counsel to others in their lives. Okay? So don't forget when we read also in 1 Corinthians 2. When we speak of God's wisdom. Do you know that God's wisdom is revealed to you and me through his spirit? And that's what it says here in 1 Corinthians 2. It says that we have the mind of Christ. Isn't that incredible? You know? Uh, the mind of Christ. The mind of God. The mind of Christ. It says we have the mind of What do you mean you don't know what to do? You have the mind of Christ. And he teaches you what he thinks. And he confirms what he teaches through his Holy Spirit to you. You have the mind of Christ. You can do it. You can walk faithfully. You can encourage others faithfully. You can make a difference in this world. Because you have the mind of Christ. 
And fourth, in a very common sense way, he was careful to put into practice what he knew. All right? He knew it, so he was going to do it. That's just a really practical approach. He was a practical man. He set up guards. He assigned responsibilities. He shares the labor. He investigates everything. That's a great factor for success. You know? He was not just winging it. He, he was doing it. And he was <coughs> making sure that everything was going the way God wants. And, you know, if all that other stuff had been forgotten, and all he focused on was the fifth one, God would have got him straight. <laughs> because he, above all else, he prayed. And we see that all the way up to here. We see that before it ever got started. It began with prayer. Before this great task took place, he had no idea what he, that God would be using him in this way. But he heard about the need. And he started praying about the need. And months went by. And God was working behind the scenes. And so when God is working on our heart, it's someone we know we need to talk to. It's some circumstance we know we need to deal with. We begin by praying, right? We, begin, we look for God to do what God can do. What only God can do. God can move mountains. He can move anything. There's no obstacle too great for him. He can do that. And it begins with prayer. And so he subjected everything to the wisdom of God. God, you got to show me. God, you got to do this. God, help me to know. He submitted everything to that. You know, one of the most helpful scriptures uh, is one most of us have probably memorized, if, if not having heard, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. For in your bulletin today. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? Lean on to, and... Lean not on your own understanding. You're, you're stupid. In your flesh, you're just dumb. So am I. Okay? So we can't do God's things on our own, our own understanding. We need God's wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him. God, God, show me. God, show me. And He'll direct your path. You know, in Psalms it says, I will instruct you, Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you, and I will teach you the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eyes. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can trust the Lord. But in verse 7, sometimes we leave that out. If not all the time, we stop with, man, trust in the Lord, and He's going to make my path straight. He's going to guard me, guide me. And in verse 7, He just reiterates, He says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Kind of like a I said don't lean on your own understanding, but in case you didn't get that one, I'm just going to say it a different way. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Okay, Fear the Lord and, and shun evil. So if you want God directing your life, just do those basic things. Okay, Begin doing those <clears throat> basic things. Have you ever watched a movie and you see at the end of it, uh, you see all the credits that go through? I'm sure you love to watch the credits. Okay? <laughs> Try it sometime. You, oh, good grief, it'll bore you to death, right? You know, but that's, uh, why do they show this stuff, you know? All these credits all the way on down to the costume designer, the choreographers, the stuntmen, cameraman A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, G. The script supervisor, the special effects coordinator, the, the construction guy, the lighting, the payroll, the travel coordinator, the publicist, the set directors, the lamp operators, I mean, the guy that plugs in the cords. It just goes on and on and on through those. It rolls through there, and I don't think those credits even cover half of the people that were involved. But you see what's happening. Why, why are those shown? Because behind the scenes, behind those recognizable faces that you just watched on the screen, are those who played roles in making that movie happen. Okay? Making that movie happen. Hundreds, if not in the thousands. Uh, for that film to go from concept to product. Without ordinary workers, movies, they would just stay dreams. That's all that would happen. All those people. And so the same could be said for many different endeavors in this world. You know, a, an Air Force pilot. Uh, you know, there's tons of staff that have to support that pilot. If you ever watched clips of the aircraft carriers, you know, there's all these guys are working for this one guy who's going to take off. And there's one guy that's going to come back. When he comes back, they've got to park that plane. It's amazing how they do that. Bring it back under. All these different people are working. And the guys in the radio tower, all these people working for that one guy. 
to be successful. For every CEO of an army uh, in the army, uh, is, or has an army of support, okay, for every CEO. How about missionaries? I think it's like six, I don't know what the number is. It's an incredible number, maybe it's 20. It's an incredible number of people in support for every one missionary that is out there that has to happen. And I have friends that are support missionaries, and I have friends that are in the tribes, okay? But it takes a tremendous number for that to happen on the field. A network of secretaries, advisors, directors, givers, prayer partners, they all commit themselves for that one missionary to be successful in the field. And when Nehemiah decided to repopulate Jerusalem, he didn't go to nobles, but he went to the list the names of the ordinary people. The ordinary people, because they were the ones that were going to continue the work and make it successful. Ordinary people that are going to be living out their lives for the glory of God. That sounds like it should be you and me, doesn't it? That if we're to do great things, if our church do great things for God, it's going to take ordinary people just living out their lives for Jesus Christ. Personalities, circumstances, value, none of that escapes the watchful eye of God. All those credits. Someday in glory, you'll be a credit. <laughs> okay. It's okay to be a credit. It's all right. That's important. That's valuable. Because everyday people who piled the stones that formed the wall, who volunteered to resettle Jerusalem, who defended the city against the violence and the corruption, and who listened with reverence to the word of God as it was read, and then they responded in repentance, turning their back against unfaithfulness to faithfulness. So let's be those people today. Let's be people who are faithful followers of Jesus, committed to the cause of Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost. Okay? Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the example of uh, Nehemiah and all those faithful people who assisted him in bringing glory back to you and honoring you in the city of Jerusalem, Lord. And God, help us to be those people today that live in a way that glorifies you, and even as a church, that together we can bring you glory in all that we think, say, and do. In Jesus' name.